I want to live the perfect life. The only way to live the perfect life is to live it in seclusion. Those were the words of William James Cetus after graduating from Harvard when he was just 16 years old. William may have been the smartest person who ever lived. His IQ was somewhere between 250 and 300. To put this into context, Einstein's IQ was estimated to be 200. William, or Billy, as he was well known, could read the New York Times when he was just 18 months old. By age eight, he had reportedly taught himself eight languages, and at 11, he became the youngest person to enroll at Harvard University. Despite his brilliance, William failed to live the perfect life he always wanted. William James Cities was born on April Fool's Day, 1898 in Boston, Massachusetts, to Jewish emigrants from Ukraine, which was then part of the Russian Empire. His parents were brilliant as well. His father, Boris, was a famous psychologist, and his mother, Sarah, was a doctor at a time when few women even attended school. William's biographer, Army Wallace, described his parents as pushy and aggressive. They believed that you could make a genius. Therefore, they desperately wanted him to seek knowledge and nothing else. His mother spent the family's savings on books, maps, and other learning tools to encourage his intellectual growth, but they had no idea just how early their child could catch on. William learned the alphabet by six months of age. And when he was just 18 months old, he could read the New York Times. By age eight, he had reportedly taught himself eight languages, which included Latin, Greek, French, Russian, German, Hebrew, Turkish, and Armenian. As if that was not impressive enough, he also invented his own language, which he called Vendergood. The brilliant youngster also wrote poetry, a novel, and even crafted a constitution for a potential utopia. William finished elementary school in less than a year and high school in just six weeks. By this time, he had already grabbed the attention of the press. When he was only nine years old, he was accepted at Harvard University, but under the condition that he had to wait until he was 11 years of age to be officially enrolled in the college. So for the next two years, he studied mathematics at Tufts University, where he reportedly spent time correcting mistakes in textbooks and combing Einstein's theory of relativity. In 1909, 11-year-old William Sittis became the youngest person to enroll at Harvard University. By this time, he was a full-blown media sensation. The press followed him closely, something that Cetus came to loathe. Cetus' mastery of complex mathematics was exceptional, that he lectured the Harvard Mathematical Club on the incredibly complex topic of four-dimensional bodies, attracting nationwide attention. MIT physics professor Daniel F. Comstock was full of praise. He said, I predict that young Cetus will be a great astronomical mathematician, he will evolve new theories and invent new ways of calculating astronomical phenomena. I believe he will be a great mathematician, the leader in that science in the future. Yet this never happened. He would grow to resent mathematics. Life was not easy at Harvard. Although he excelled in schoolwork, William failed terribly outside of the classroom. He had no interest in girls or in any aspect of social life and had been made a laughingstock by his much older classmates. He admitted he had never kissed a girl. He was teased and chased, and it was humiliating. Nevertheless, Sidis earned his Bachelor of Arts degree on June 18, 1914, at the age of 16. After graduating, he told reporters, I want to live the perfect life. The only way to live the perfect life is to live it in seclusion. Shortly after graduating, he took a job at Rice Institute, now Rice University, in Houston, Texas, as a mathematics teaching assistant. He arrived at Rice in December 1915 at the age of 17. Just like Harvard, William didn't fit in at Rice. Students teased him for never having kissed a girl and often disrespected him. After only eight months, he left his post at Rice and enrolled at Harvard Law School in 1916. For unknown reasons, he dropped out in his final year and failed to earn a law degree. Shortly after dropping out of college in 1919, he took up socialist causes. In that same year, he was arrested for participating in a socialist May Day parade in Boston that turned violent. Since he had a celebrity-like status in the media, his arrest made headlines in several newspapers at that time. Sidis defended himself and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. 
six months for rioting, and a year for assaulting an officer. However, later, his parents arranged with the district attorney to have him held at his father's sanatorium and to work at MIT instead of prison. Despite previously telling the Boston Herald that he vowed to remain celibate, saying, women do not appeal to me. It was in jail that he met the only woman he ever loved, an Irish socialist named Martha Foley. Although Martha went on to marry another man, Siddes carried a photograph of her in his pocket until the day he died. When her memoirs were published, she briefly mentioned Sidis in a single line, referring to him as the famous and tragic prodigy who was the first boy ever to pay court to me. After he was released from his father's institution, William moved to the East Coast, where he was determined to live a private life away from the public eye. He also became estranged from his parents and even refused to attend his father's funeral in 1923. According to William's biographer, the reason was that he refused to see his mum. William hated the way she dominated him as a child. He also disowned his knowledge of mathematics and took menial jobs, such as bookkeeping. The very sight of mathematical formulae makes me physically ill, he later admitted. All I want to do is run an adding machine, but they won't let me alone. Whenever he was recognized or his colleagues learned who he was, he would promptly quit and find another job. He kept moving from city to city, job to job, often using an alias. All the while, he wrote several books, some under his own name, others under a variety of pseudonyms. Some of the books included a 1,200-page history of the United States and a book on streetcar transfer tickets. In 1925, he wrote his most famous work, The Animate and the Inanimate, which touches on the origin of life and cosmology. Cetes lived successfully out of the limelight until 1937, when an article published in The New Yorker about what had become of the boy genius brought him back to the limelight. According to his biographer, Sidis thought the article's description of him was humiliating and made him sound crazy. William Sidis accused The New Yorker magazine of libel and of violating his privacy, and he filed a lawsuit against the publication. However, the judge dismissed the case. After he lost the appeal, the once idolized Sidis did not live much longer. He won the libel case in 1944, but died of a cerebral hemorrhage the same year at the age of 46. William Sidis was buried beside his father in New Hampshire. William Sidis remains the premier case study of a failed child prodigy. His journey also shows that human life has so many different elements and that intelligence alone can't always guarantee a fulfilling life. Did William Sidis' parents push him too hard? Let me know in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching.